This is Dr. This is Dr. Charles Ripley. He is my professor for SGS 340, Political Violence and Human Rights. Um, I would recommend everyone to take a class with him. He's a brilliant professor. Um, Dr. Ripley um, has a PhD in international relations and comparative politics with an emphasis in statistical analysis, US foreign policy, international political economy, and Latin American politics. Um, he, has, he has published a broad range of peer-reviewed articles on global themes such as the impact of privatization in Nicaragua, the role of monetary unions in South America, and Colombia's internal security. I believe he will be talking to us about Nicaragua and Colombia tonight. Right. And you read that off your phone beautifully. Mark. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not a brilliant professor. You shouldn't take my class. You'll be very disappointed. Uh, so thanks for having me. I'm unable to see the people I'm speaking to. Is there any way you can change the thing around? Oh, he just put it around. All right. How many I, people are I here? There, yeah, there's no other way. <laughs> I don't know. I guess in my classes, I have a different situation where I can actually show the uh, thing. So anyway, but it's not that important. How many people are we speaking to tonight, Mohammed? So I get an idea. Six. Six people came out. All right. See, see how great <laughs> and brilliant I am. But I do appreciate you people coming out, and I do appreciate the United Nations. I actually spoke... Um, to the uh, the high school, I don't know what you would call it, uh, Mock United Nations, uh, a while back before the COVID when there was another leader of the United Nations. I don't know if after the, or during the COVID, if it kind of dropped in numbers or what's going on, but I do appreciate your kind of energy for the United Nations. And I'm going to begin and then I'll take questions. It won't be too long is that I actually had the unique opportunity to do um, contract work for the United Nations uh, on the ground stuff, a little technical. And then I taught English to people working for the United Nations where I lived for eight years. I lived in Nicaragua. So I have a kind of unique experience of on the ground with the United Nations, not as like, say, I didn't get paid that much money. I don't have a pension with them or anything else. But I noticed that they do things that people don't understand that they do. And this was part of the uh, uh, food program that they help with developing countries. And they did what, what the first thing I want to note is they did hire local people. And I was actually impressed with that. Obviously, I'm not a local Nicaraguan, but everyone else on the ground was, well, one was from Poland. The other was from all of them were from Nicaragua. And I was impressed with that. Uh, because a lot of NGOs, IGOs, and other uh, entities that go from the developing world to, I'm sorry, the developed world to the developing world, if we want to use that discourse, usually hire their own, right? And then a few people who aren't as... Um, you know, in high positions. And I was impressed and they really wanted to educate the people on the ground. So they hired me uh, to teach them English. And uh, I kind of learned a lot about the process and how they're filling some of these gaps that uh, you don't really hear about because you hear more about the negative things. And I think that's about with everything. But with the United Nations, it's particularly pernicious. So like you'll hear the United Nations failed to stop the Iraq war, even though the Security Council was against it. You hear, you know, obviously the horrors of Rwanda that the United Nations failed. And then you hear, you know, the blue helmet babies and other things, you know, of uh, people in the United Nations going in. And there is actually a good, I think it's a frontline documentary on the sexual assault of, of, of some people on the ground. And I think all those have to be explored. But the United Nations, let's face it, that's what we have. And one of the things is, is that they actually do a lot of good on the ground. And uh, before I was actually shut down by COVID, I was in Colombia doing research. And uh, basically, I was doing research on the peace process. And I authored an article that's under review, Mohammed read it for the class. And one of the case studies was how Santos, the, the former president of Colombia, used Cuba to open space for these kind of creative conflict resolution policies in that kind of South-South relations. But one of the key parts of this process, you have to remember, this is the longest civil war in Latin American history. That's what I focus on. And it's pretty interesting how in order to get this peace process going, the government used Cuba. But 
Cuba can only do so much, Norway can only do so much, etc. So you have this guerrilla group fighting for over 60 years. How do you actually get them to release their weapons? And I'm talking about the logistics of this. This is where the United Nations played a key role uh, in Colombia and uh, stopping the um the war, or at least facilitating the peace process, I should say. So what they did was it was the United Nations who actually got involved to collect all the military weaponry of the FARC and EP in order to create peace. They also set up education funding. They also set up kind of refugees because we forget we just don't have refugees. We have refugees within countries after these brutal civil wars in Colombia, like there were like millions displaced and, and just tens of thousands of killed. And only the United Nations could do such a thing in order uh, to uh, help this country uh, uh, get for, you know, facilitate the peace process and actually collect these weapons, which and and try to educate the people, incorporate them into uh, different stratas of society, so they don't have to go back to fighting. Uh, set up, you know, uh, uh, areas, safe areas for people, uh, etc. So this is quite a, a Herculean task. And people don't really think about that. They usually, you know, gravitate to the negative. And with this peace process, the FARC became a political party. The FARC EP is the guerrilla group that was fighting for like 60 years. And behind me, that's not my house. That's actually a picture of the former FARC uh, uh, leader in the FARC headquarters. I went to the headquarters uh, to do research, to do interviews and things like that. I took this picture and I'll have others uh, behind me. And, you know, he's not a very popular figure with a lot of Colombians, but still he is an important figure. Uh, he was killed and and he, you know, became, you know, a martyr. One of the best things about getting killed, uh, you know, if I go, I'd like to be killed. Then you become a martyr, right? So that'd be not, not a bad way to go, right? Um, and you know, he became kind of like the, 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 now the de facto head of the party and they became a political party running elections, etc. Now everything isn't great. The Colombian people voted against by like a, a minimal infinitesimal point, a percentage point against the process, but then they took it back to the legislature, fixed some things, and the peace process took hold in 2016. Uh, without the role of the United Nations in just this one case study, I don't know if you would have ever been able to collect the weaponry. Now, as I stress, and I can't stress enough, it's not perfect. Some guerrillas went back to fighting, other people, you know, uh, I talk about this in my political violence class, I won't reiterate it here for the reasons, but, you know, without the role of the United Nations, would have the FARC been able to lay down its weapons? Is there an uh, a international entity to, to collect those weapons and to actually do research on how many weapons they had, where they came from, how much is being collected, etc.? I don't think so. So I think that's one of the positive aspects of the United Nations. It's not a perfect institution, international institution by any means, but it's what we have. And if you see some of the good it actually does, it is in the long run, I think, worth uh, uh, um, the um, price tag. And, you know, with a lot of people going after the United Nations, I mean, I do think it's it, it has a, a important role, a pivotal role within society. And I think the Colombian case study is one of the most important. So I'll end there and see if anyone had any questions, if they want any more information, et cetera. Yeah, Max. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfectly, okay. Uh, I think Mo mentioned that you researched a little of American politics. Um, how, how, if you did, how much did you, like, how, how much time did you spend researching American politics and like what specific area of American politics did you research? Are you asking me what my area of research is in international politics of Latin America? Yeah. And more specifically, America, too, if you did any research there. Yeah, I lived, I actually lived in Nicaragua eight years. Uh, the United Nations is having a tough time in Nicaragua because Ortega, uh, you know, is, has gone a little crazy and keeps on running and running. Uh, this is one of the problems the United Nations has is that, you know, it's basically to what extent 
you know, do you step on a country's sovereignty and say, look at you're not a legitimate leader and to what extent does it have to recognize under these conditions? And we actually got in a good debate, Mohammed will tell you about that today, about the role of the United Nations in Afghanistan, should it or shouldn't it um, recognize the Taliban? But towards my research, I lived there for eight years. I was a professor at La Universidad at Centro Americana. And then uh, I learned a lot. And the United Nations, one of the also the other things is, this is in Colombia, this is Nicaragua, but people have a bigger respect for the United Nations. Uh, I, I, you know, living in a country for eight years, you get to really understand the people. And they, they do have a certain respect for the United Nations that I think other entities don't have, particularly in Latin America, the United States, the organization of, of, of um, the OAS, the Organization of American States that the a lot of people think is just dominated by the United States. You go to Eastern Europe, obviously, they're a little dominated by Russia. And, you know, the United Nations really, they have a tendency to listen to them. One of the things I do in one of my classes, which is based on my research, and the international law class, it's online if, if anyone is in it, is that, you know, during the cases, the international court cases of um, Bolivia versus Chile, because Chile stole, I mean, we all stole, stale land, people forget, you know, they'll say Latin America, but Latin America has huge conflict, is that Bolivia has taken Chile to the International Court of Justice a number of times. One of the interesting things about the case, which I think is quite different than in other cases, is that Chile and uh, Bolivia and Peru is involved as well. All listen to these cases. Uh, you know, the United Nations is kind of elevated. If there's a case with the United States and the United Nations, probably no one is going to know about it. But people in these developing countries do know about it. Uh, and I had the chance to teach next to the near the uh, people who studied derecho law in Nicaragua, and they took the United States. People forget to the International Court of Justice, the United Nations in. 1984 and, and, and won the court case uh, that the United States was interfering in their politics through what we call the Contra War, which was a war uh, against um, the Sandinistas who the United States didn't like, Ronald Reagan in particular. So um, it's pretty interesting that uh, this, is, this case is always being talked about in Nicaragua and it, it's very, very important. And, and that's my research. It isn't just on the United Nations or Latin America. But it, it basically really does demonstrate the role of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, and other um, other uh, uh, entities have with the developing world that we don't understand sometimes. Because if you're from the United States, you're very powerful, so you don't have to listen to the United Nations. But one case was our, uh, Ghana took an Argentine vessel to its ports and kept it there because Argentina owed money to these vulture funds. Uh, and Argentina took them to the, you know, a part of the United Nations, the law of the sea, uh, and took them to this other court, the court uh, in Hamburg, Germany. My German's a little off. And basically Argentina won and opposed to Ghana saying, we're not gonna listen to the court it actually released the Argentine vessel and said, well, the United Nations, that is the law of the sea, the court system said it was illegal for us to have this ship, so we have to let it go. Uh, people don't do case studies a lot in things like this because, you know, people, if you're from, you know, United States, who cares? I'm worried about inflation and stuff. But th these these courts, the United Nations, et cetera, has a certain respect throughout the developing world. I'm not saying every person loves the United Nations or anything like that. Uh, they also carry out truth commissions. Uh, one, as Mohammed took my class, was in El Salvador, uh, where the United Nates Nations Truth Commission came to uh, the conclusion that uh, Archbishop Romero during the war in the 1980s was killed by a name, man named Dalbuison, who we were supporting, of course. And, you know, so it, it does play this, this role in these countries that I think goes unsung. And my research kind of focuses on uh, some of these spaces that uh, develop that we really don't know about. So I hope that kind of <laughs> answered somewhat of your question. Thank you. Yeah. So my question here is, oh, what, what's the day to day look like uh, while, you work, uh, while you're working at United Nations? What is, what's the day to day look like uh, when working at that organization and whether is there 
there are specific criteria uh, or qualifications needed in order to pursue for that looking for yeah, that's a good that. question. Um, my day to day life when I was working was just a contract worker. So, uh, but it was interesting. Uh, for Nicaragua is kind of a sleepy country. In fact, they used to make a joke: How did you get a revolution off the ground? <laughs> um, but it was very efficient. Um, they were there every day on time. Everyone was moving forward. Uh, they had to get the food out. These people were there studying English, and they actually cared. They wanted to learn uh, the language. Uh, I would say about your careers, you, the, the one thing is making it SPIRA account. That's uh, I-N-S-P-I-R-A. I don't think there's an R there. And what the United, it's very difficult because I wanted to uh, make it account because, you know, I'm an academic, but I have free time and there's a lot going on in Latin America. So I said to myself, why don't I do some contract work? Um, but like more prestigious than I did in Nicaragua uh, and work in diplomacy or something like that while I stay at the university. And it's a pretty tough uh, <laughs> um, website. It took a long time and I still haven't finished it. Uh, you know, all your criteria, languages, skills, et cetera. Uh, you really, you know, they are, it is a competitive field. Uh, uh, they also have a website. I can send it to Mohammed to send to you people. Um, yeah, you should have a canvas shell maybe, and then you can share stuff on that. And what uh, the they have these internships, and I used to do it in my professional development class when I taught the SGS professional development class, is I had them look at all the jobs. One of the best things about the United Nations is that when you go even to their internships and you look at their jobs, even if you don't want to work at the United Nations, they have the thickest, just most comprehensive descriptions of the expectations of the job, qualifications, expectations, what you need what you will need to do, etc. I strongly recommend uh, people to go to the uh, United Nations general website, this isn't what the Inspire account, and look at some of those jobs. And even if you're not interested in working there, they really give you so much detail that you can actually learn how to tailor both your resume and cover letter to certain jobs in this area. So if you look for like even legal work in the United Nations or conflict resolution or something like that, uh, the descriptions are so thick and plentiful that, you know, you can really learn, oh, I need this class. Oh, I need this skill. Oh, in order to get into that field. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, could you explain more about the recent elections in South America? About what, I'm sorry? The recent elections in South America? Mohammed, could you? I can't really hear well. Recent elections in South America. Elections? Yeah, which country? I think it was Argentina. 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 Yeah, about that. Recent elections in Argentina. Oh, Argentina. That wasn't the election. Election, Yeah, but they lost the house. This is Argentina is an interesting country. I was there uh, recently. In fact, if I can... Uh, change my backdrop. I love this one. This is about the indigenous person who was killed in Argentina, although they think he was, he was, he wasn't killed or was he killed? It's a big thing. He was a Mapuche indigenous. And as you can see, it says Somos uh, Santiago. Uh, the Mapuche indigenous people are, don't feel like they're part of the state of Argentina and they're also in Chile. That's Buenos Aires behind me. I took that that photo, all the photos you see I take because, you know, I just don't want to get off the internet. I like to bring the experience to the classroom or to whatever I do. So it's pretty interesting how um, the elections go uh, back and forth. But you have to understand Macri's election to the presidency a while ago was a big deal because it was the first non-Peronist uh, candidate that actually won. But he ended up actually doing a pretty crappy job uh, and making a deal with the devil. And when I say a devil, I'm talking about the IMF, which has the worst reputation in Argentina for one of the biggest bailouts, if not the biggest bailout in history. So then um, Fernandez, as Cristina became vice president, and Fernandez, another one, the old economic advisor of, of her husband, and they didn't really get along, uh, Cristina and the new president, but got elected president. Um, but, you know, it's extremely difficult. I would not want to be a president 
in any country right now under these conditions. I don't care if you're right wing, left wing, whatever. So they basically, you know, like the United States often happens, you lose the house, the bicameral system that we have, et cetera. You lose Buenos Aires. Uh, that's the, the main city, obviously. And I'm pretty sure they lost uh, Christina's home uh, uh, province. So the thing is, is that it, it's been going back and forth. Argentina has been fighting battles of inflation. Uh, the COVID has ravaged the country. Uh, also, there was a picture of Fernandez, President Fernandez, the, the, the new president. He and he was having a party without masks while they're under, you know, these big lockdowns and things like that. And, you know, then he later came out and said, oh, this is a mistake. So you can see why uh, they would lose uh, 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 escaños, they're called in, in Spanish, uh, depending on the country, uh, the thing. So we're going to see what happens uh, next when the presidential election comes up. I, I don't know, you know, though, I haven't been following it that much, but um, I, it's uh, inflation has just been disastrous for Argentina. I mean, since the 1990s. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much... Um, uh, I think about every country in Latin America now, whether it's Colombia, they've had horrible protests that they, they killed even before the COVID a man named uh, 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 Dylan, I forget his name, but I do a big uh, thing on him in my YouTube thing in Colombia or lecture on it. Uh, you know, it's it's been disastrous. Obviously, you've probably heard about Brazil, Bolsonaro, um, all of the countries. Bolivia has been OK. Arce is... Um, uh, Morales is former economic advisor who actually won the presidency because Evo Morales, you know, lost favor with the people, but uh, his economic policies were very popular and it brought in um, his former economic advisor. Uh, and then you have Chile uh, not doing too well, obviously, with those protests, were, were, which is horrendous for the government. Uh, Paraguay, you, you hear less about, but they've always had an instability and a growing guerrilla group that people don't really talk about uh, that might get worse under the COVID. Um, you know, one time, uh, I forget his name slipping my mind, but the former president tried to change the constitution of Paraguay to run again, and they basically burnt the Congress to the ground. You don't hear too much about that. Um, Uruguay has been quite stable. It's been kind of lucky in that sense, in my opinion. Peru just elected a, uh, a, a lefty against uh, uh, um, the Chinita. The, sorry, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> but in Latin America, anyone would like that looks Chinese, even though she's Japanese descended, called Chino a China. And it's not offensive because her father, Fujimori, ran the country and they used to call him Chinito, Chino. Um, but uh, she lost Keiko, who was right wing. She studied actually at Boston University and a left winger, uh, a extreme, and I don't want to say extreme, but like, you know, not center left, but tilt even more left, won the presidency. And we're going to see what happens there. Yep. Um, okay, Dr. Ripley, I have uh, two questions. So one is, do you think that in Peru the situation will uh, uh, stay the same uh, since Congress is now led by white some people? Do you think in Peru the situation will stay the same because Congress is now led by white people? Do you think in Peru the situation will stay the same because Congress is dominated by a right wing party? Yeah, it, that, that's one of the things. I, what I've noticed is this in a nutshell living in Latin America. Here in the United States, there's corruption. Here in every country. But people are somewhat more satisfied here in the United States. Like, look at me. Like, I, 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 if I was in Latin America when I was a president of the University of Central America, I used to go to the protests. They have these morteros. They shoot. I'll show you, et cetera. Because, you know, people aren't that economically stable. And this kind of feeds into your question. Uh, here, you know, people have mortgages. People have health care. Like, I just did my health care here for the kids. And, um, you know, it's like, I, I'm not going to go out in the street and protest because, you know, my kids need health care. I have a mortgage. It's a little more stability. Here's a student from my uh, one of my <laughs> from the University of Central Americana. That's a mortero he has. And they go in the street and go and fight quite often, like not like like maybe a couple of times a month and, and shut down the university and stuff like that in the back. They're breaking things. Um, e Latin American politics, and I'm sure Africa and others, is very unstable. And they're always just trying, trying to put everyone in prison. Um, 
you know, I would not want to be president of Peru. And you're right. It's like, look at every single solitary Peruvian leader has been, you know, either, you know, later um, accused of something. They can't finish their term. You know, you don't even, you begin not even to know their names, right? Garcia, Alan Garcia, very tall, big guy, you know, finally took his own life because he was going to go to prison. He was president twice. Um, you know, I don't know if, if it's able to stable because to, to stabilize, you have to have a good amount of, of, of economic uh, development. And without that, people will take to the streets. It's, it's, it's called embedded liberalism. We call it a lot of different things theoretically. But the idea is, you know, if you give someone a house, a mortgage, health care, they become more conservative. They're less likely to go to the street, et cetera. It's very difficult to do that with all the poverty in these developing countries. So, you know, with this, you know, conundrum I, I, and, and the obviously the um, not holding all the power that he would like, the new president is going to be under extreme pressure uh, by the right and, and by others who don't like him, um, you know, lefty parties and stuff like that. Uh, to basically, I think, step down, you know, every they're going to be, you know, citing it. Oh, he's corrupt. He's corrupt. He's corrupt. And most of these presidents don't make it through. Um, there was a president that actually did stabilize for a while, but then they were calling him um, um, corrupt. Uh, he actually was an, uh, partly indigenous. He um, used to, as a kid, shine shoes in uh, Lima. And he went all the way to Stanford University for economics. Uh, and he did actually a pretty decent job in some ways, in some ways not, but he managed to stabilize his name slipping my mind because there's so many of these people that come and go. Uh, and I wrote a pa paper on him and it was pretty interesting. But even after him, you know, they wanted to put him in jail, et cetera. So one of the biggest problems is you're not just dealing when you don't have that Congress or Congreso. It's not just you don't have people voting for you, right? I mean, you can still get things done. Ronald Reagan worked with the Democrats. Tip O'Neill, who's from Massachusetts, you know, they worked together well, even though they were from opposite parties. You don't see that as much in Latin America. It's more like they're really trying to dispose you at any, any turn. So getting something done is probably even the least of this guy's trouble. Uh, it, to make sure he can make it through his term, which I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is five years. Um, so, you know, I think when you don't have control of the Congress in Latin America, yeah, you're pretty much not a lame duck. I would say a dead duck uh, because they're really going to do everything they can to try to not only block your agenda, but uh, to dispose you. And remember, in the United States, it's different. A lot of Democrat and Republican presidents have gotten along well. I mean, not perfectly well, but with their counterparts passing things, Clinton with Newt Gingrich helped pass, for example, welfare reform and uh, NAFTA, the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know whether you like those or hate them. It doesn't matter. It's just they're able to get something done. So, yeah, I don't think he's going to get much done unless he goes by la ley marcial, <laughs> martial law. But they would say it depends on the country how you say it. Go ahead. What was your second question? Yeah. Uh, my second question is, you said in a video that it's posted on uh, your website up there, it said that Lenin Moreno, Lenin Moreno one of the residents of Ecuador, uh, basically made protests illegal. What, were, what was the motivation for him to do that? Could you, he said Lenin Moreno, the... Oh, you, said, um, you said that in one of your videos that Lenin Moreno made protests illegal. What was his motivation to do that? Yeah, that's right. Lenin Moreno is an interesting character. Um, I, I, I don't remember saying he made it completely illegal, but it's funny. I, I wrote this paper that got published and someone from Ecuador, very rich because his English was perfect, uh, really gave me a shot on it and said, you know, you're, you're trying to destroy Ecuadorian politics or something like that. Um, Lenin Moreno is no longer the president, but he's an interesting character in the fact that he was uh, in a wheelchair. Um, he was, uh, I believe, shot and he was put in a wheelchair and then he became Rafael Correa's 
uh, vice president and Rafael Correa, who's center left, supported him 100 percent. And when he got in, he took a right turn and it was very interesting. And a lot of the things he did was like, well, Rafael Correa was too authoritarian, you know, et cetera. But one of the things is, is that when these people and when I say people, I'm not talking about right, left. I'm just talking about survival. Um get into office. Sometimes they try to curb protests because they think it's going to get out of control. And he was right. Uh, he, he was at literally had to be moved during the anti IMF protests from uh, the capital, which I've been a million times, uh, uh, Quito to Guayaquil, which is a um, a um, a port town that was the largest city I've never been to, but the largest city in Ecuador uh, for fear of his life. So when he was trying to curb those protests, yes, he was he was basically saying you can't go out. They were trying to curb them through these legal mess, uh, these legal avenues, because it was true. I mean, they were getting so out of control, but he had no other choice. So he he went to Guayaquil and then uh, he eliminated some of the most um, pernicious laws that the IMF wanted to enact. And one of those was the subsidies of gas. Uh, in these very, this goes into what I said before, in these very poor countries, I don't think people understand the IMF, World Bank, et cetera, that, you know, you, you, you do, a, 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 you look on paper. And I gave people classes when I was teaching English at La Universidad Santo Americana, you know, who worked in these big institutions. And you, you look at the papers and you say, oh, let's just cut this a little and, and cut hair a little and cut hair a little and we get the budget under control, for example, right? It doesn't look like that much on paper and most are coming from the upper class who work on these projects. So they don't understand what it's like to not have these subsidies, which will put you in massive poverty. So the sub, cutting the subsidies of gas was a titanic mistake because one, you know, even if, it, if, if it's just like, say, $5 a month, someone might say, what's $5 a month? To a person making $200 a month, $500, $5 a month is a lot. And remember, they use the dollar. Uh, second, he made a titanic mistake because it wasn't just the poor people that were against it, but all the people who do Uber, all the people who do taxis. When I went to the last time I went to the um, airport, I got picked up by a taxi driver. He needs those subsidies to maintain his uh, net profit. Um, a lot of people in Latin America are just taxi drivers because that's the job they can get. So like this guy made such a titanic mistake by following the IMF, which is a motif in probably developing country history that they don't understand. The IMF is always saying things like, oh, cut bread subsidies. It, that's disastrous for these developing countries. So, yeah, he tried to curb these protests in some legal ways. It did not work. Indigenous people are out there and uh, just a broad range of other people. And if you do end up ruling a country, always remember interest conversion where, you know, if you do get rid of something or you have to make tough choices, make sure it's not a broad spectrum of people that are going to fail the pain because then you'll get a huge protest like Lenin Moreno uh, basically had. And he went out uh, with, uh, what did T.S. Eliot say? With a uh, whimper instead of a bang. Any other questions? Yep. So could you talk about how the UN High Commission of Re on Refugees, um, what was it, sorry. Okay, um, how does the UN High Commission on Refugees help um, uh, internally displaced people and refugees within Latin America? Um, first, I wanted to thank the person who asked the question for actually watching the videos <laughs> that I produce. Some people are supposed to it by students, they don't. Um, that's difficult to say because every country is different. As you probably know, Mohammed, you know, Turkey and other countries have kicked out the United Nations and other NGOs 
uh, that help these uh, eternally and externally displaced people. Um, I would say it's it's tough. They have the resources, right? So in Colombia, for example, they are able to set up uh, these areas where former combatants and others are. They are controversial. They're not safe. I've never visited them. I was supposed to, but the COVID hit go out and see these um, camps. Uh, I was working for Arco Iri, so doing things with them. And that means rainbow. And it's like Nuevo Arco Iri, that's something like that, New Rainbow Coalition. And they work with um, the former combatants in Colombia and how they were setting up, the United Nations was helping set up these refugee camps. I was supposed to go out uh, with them, but obviously the COVID hit and and other reasons. I also question safety issues because they do, uh, the Colombians who also hate when foreigners go there and like make a circus out of it. Like, oh, this is your entertainment. We've suffered for 60 years. And I mean, that's not probably most of the people who go out there's intentions, Um, but I didn't end up going out personally to see. So I don't want to give a um, 100% a, uh, uh, too much on that, but uh, they're the only game in town, basically, to help set up these camps. They try to set up education camps because one of the things, if you see another video of mine, um, they try to. This isn't the United Nations, but of just a broad spectrum of, of of international organizations, governmental and non-governmental organization. I purposely put here in my uh, virtual background, um, something, uh, if I can find it, do, 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 uh, where they basically are trying to sell FARC products and to incorporate people into um, the, um, the system. And I'm not seeing it, but it, I have a video on that. And it's like, they do all these different kinds of cool things uh, to help um, the far, let me see if I can get it here. Let me add an image. Um, and, you know, they do f- help facilitate that stuff. And that's extremely important because what they do is basically, oh, here's a, that's the beer they were selling. I don't know if you can uh, see it perfectly. Up top is beer. They sell beer, coffee. That's uh, Bolivariana. That's what they call like, you know, that's Simon Bolivar. I don't know if you can see it well, but that's a place that was set up to help these quote unquote refugees, but more combatants and other people who face the war to sell products and they sell a ton of products. Uh, that's just bare uh, <laughs> because it's a pizzeria, but also there, there was coffee, shoes, clothes, etc. So, So the point here to link that to is they're not just trying to set up refugee camps and then, you know, in a, in a month, they just leave. They're trying to set them up with skills, products. Uh, a lot of, um, if you remember, the Grameen Bank that became popular in Bangladesh, that kind of model where they try to set up this, these, you know, former combatants and other people to be entrepreneurs and help out. It's, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a Herculean task. It's like a titanic task to do, but um that I went to, and that was like, it's like just a hodgepodge of all the products the FARC and other people are making to try to get them off the ground. And the bear was pretty good, so I can't really complain. And the pizza was as well. And the coffee, very strong combatant to coffee. Anything else on all this? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ripley. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much. And to anyone, if you ever have a question about anything that I do or you're interested in, uh, just uh, send me an email whenever you want and you can get in contact with me through Mohammed. Thanks a lot for having me, Mohammed. I'm glad that the United Nations, uh, this group is back and doing something <laughs> after the COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.